control room up there, but I guess. Go. Well, we are live, streaming live on Facebook, and we'll also have a YouTube link for folks to see a most incredible discussion that we're going to have this morning with two distinguished guests. My name is Terrence Wall. On behalf of the Holmdale Chamber of Commerce, welcome to our September meeting. We are thrilled to be in Bellworks, uh, the reimagined building of Somerset Development, and Mr. Ralph Zucker and his team. And we, as always, want to thank him so much for uh, hosting us so we can bring to folks, businesses, uh, and the residents in the area, wonderful news every single month so they can take and learn and bring that back to their businesses and their families. Today is incredibly special. You know, I always, I always when you're in conversations from time to time, we'd say, you know, gee whiz, it's, it's such a small world. I found out recently it's really, really not. We're going to talk about that a little bit today because we have Dr. Robert Woodrow Wilson, who was involved with the Horn Antenna and discoveries as an American astronomer, along with Arno Penzias, discovered cosmic microwave background radiation that resulted also in the 1978 Nobel Prize. In addition, studies of the stars, the constellations, the cosmos, and so many tremendously interesting things that provide a glimpse into our history, not just of our area, our town, our country, the universe. It's so palpable, and I'm so excited and honored to be with you today. And the history of his fine work and the work of his peers and so many other folks that were here with Bell Works and Crawford Hill, without it being documented, without folks being able to look back and study it and learn from it and grow and discover the next big thing, you'd have a tremendous vacuum, but not when you archive it and you preserve history. So we also have with us our Monmouth County clerk, Christine Hanlon, elected in 2015. She's serving the county with skill, dignity, and grace and expertise in her background as the Monmouth County clerk, as well as, I believe, a 20-year background in law, serving most recently with Archer Griner. So thank you both so much for being here today. Very welcome. Yeah, we're, thank you. Glad to be with you. I'm glad you're here. We're going to have a fantastic conversation. We're going to get right to it. We are streaming live to Facebook, and so thousands of folks are going to watch this, so we're going to get right to it. And we're always appreciative of the folks who are able to join our small audience today. So we're going to go around the room so, so uh, Dr. Wilson and Ms. Hanlon know who you are Check. and who you represent, because... We also have an internship program in Homedale Schools, and we have representatives here. So this isn't just about today. This is about folks learning, our physics students, other folks that are interested in archiving records management and making history as well as preserving it. So if we can, thank you. Good morning. My name is Brooke. Um, I'm on the NPZ team here doing the marketing and design for Bellworks. Thank you, Brooke. Hi, good morning. I'm Elliot Cohen, the internship coordinator at Homedale High School. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and I'm here with my supervisor, uh, Kara McConnell. Hi, everyone. Kara McConnell, supervisor in Homedale Township Schools. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, thank you for having us. Doreen Regal, the transition coordinator for the Homedale School District. Um, I had kids doing internships and job sampling in mail room and different entry levels and I help kids with disabilities get out there and get hands-on learning experiences and I thank anybody and anybody who want, would like to show their careers or anything to offer us um, opportunities just to listen to what you do or give us time to volunteer in your offices or businesses it would be greatly appreciated hands-on learning really helps Doreen, and thank you for the small miracles, really, that I've witnessed. I had the opportunity to provide an internship for one of Doreen's students, and it really enriched my life. Thank you. Eric Hines, um, this is a real treat for me, uh, having finally been back in the building after quite some time. You know, I was the mayor, at really, when we took on this big challenge. And to watch some of the programs with Doreen in the school that we worked through the Hope for Children Foundation, which I run, and, and obviously combining that with what we were able to accomplish, um, it really was a wonderful partnership with Ralph. And what you're doing here to continue is, is super. So I thank you and Terrence for continuing to, to help broadcast and share this really, because this is a special place. It's a destination hub. 
and we should be capturing all the wonderful technological uh, advances that will continue to happen at such a, a such a hub. So Eric Hines, and I'm really thrilled to be part of this history. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And what Eric did not say is that he's one of the founding board members along with Terrence and I and a, and a handful of other great people from Homedale. So thank you, Eric. Hey, doing? Sean Keating, longtime uh, Homedale resident. Neighbor up here for uh, Mr. Wilson. Love to hear what he has to say. Uh, local business owner, do tax and wealth planning. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jorge Gana, uh, a longtime resident here. My my father, um, also Jorge Gana, happened to work um, at uh, Bell Labs from around 79 to 84 uh, as, as well. Uh, and I'll share an anecdote with you uh, after this is done um, because I actually distinctly recall uh, him pointing out, you know, the, the great man uh, who had just won the Nobel Prize over 40 years ago, we, we ran into you at the Mammoth Mall. I remember, if I recall correctly, you had a bit of a reddish beard and, and reddish hair on the sides at the time, but uh, it's, it's uh, very nice to, uh, to see you here today. Hi, I'm uh, Jorge Gana's wife, Rose Gana, and I'm here to enjoy this um, amazing lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Hi, Al Aloisi, your independent insurance broker, life insurance, health insurance, etc. Also certified in uh, senior citizen uh, Medicare Advantage plans as well, and um, happy to be here. And the folks who uh, came in here today and walked in, the beautiful piano that you heard from the grand piano in the center foyer of Bell Works is uh, from Al Aloisi, our resident pianist. Yes, thank you, Al. Russ McKeever, Connections Unlimited. In my paid life, I am a computer consultant, so the work that was done here is not lost on me. In my unpaid life, I am vice chairman at Allaire Village, and I am also involved with the Parker Homestead, arguably the oldest English-built structure in New Jersey, and I am often involved in preservation efforts within the greater Ocean Township and Asbury Park area. Thank you. Hello, my name's Colleen Regan. I live in Homedale with my husband who was born and raised in Homedale, Timothy Regan, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Azida Asa. I'm a current resident of Coles Neck, but I love Homedale, so I spend most of my time here. And uh, since we were talking about Bell Labs, I have worked in this building for several years when it was Lucent Technologies, and I have great memories among many other careers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and you're making your way across. One of the wonderful parts about the chamber and the monthly meetings that we have, uh, it's a volunteer organization, and folks are, uh, you could follow us at Homedale Chamber on Facebook. But it's the, it's the networking, the organic networking from folks talking, the Ghana's coming here, uh, the, the chance meeting in Monmouth Mall with, with, with such significant history. It's really amazing. Um, and I'll wrap up with I'm Jeannie Wall, and I'm the owner of um, Hometown News, publishing for Tap Into, covering daily news for Holmdale, Colts Neck, Middletown, Hazlitt, Keyport, and really all over Monmouth County. So thank you. Thank you so much. Is everyone ready to get started? Well, you know, let's start with a simple question that uh, for all of us that we think we're, we're, we're in our own universe, right? Mm -hmm. We think we're in our own universe, in our communities, but they don't maybe quite understand what, what that means. Can you outline for us the contours of the universe? Oh. Well, one way to do it is <clears throat> start right here on Earth. Um, we're very familiar with our Earth. And most of us know something about the planets and the sun. So the Earth is rotating around the sun. The moon rotates around the Earth. Various other planets have moons. Uh, and we have an, uh, something we call the astronomical unit, which is the distance from the Earth to the sun. Now, if we go out from there uh, and take a much bigger picture, um, the sun is located in the outer parts of the Milky Way galaxy, 
which is a collection of, uh, I don't know, 100 billion stars or something like that, most of which have planets and which all rotate around the center of mass of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is just one of 100 billion other galaxies, many of which we can see when we use powerful telescopes. So we're really a very tiny part of the universe. Um, I don't know whether you want to go into the beginning at this point. Well, you know, part of your work is, you know, they say in, in life there's six degrees of separation, but is it actually three degrees of radiation? <laughs> yes. Um, Can you share that, that incredible story? Right. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I, I went to Rice University, which was just down the street from me in Houston, and then went to Caltech to do a PhD. When I got there, I discovered a new radio astronomy group that was just starting to go, and I joined them to do my PhD. Is that with Mr. Penzias, Dr. Penzias? No, no, uh -huh. no. We'll get to him in a bit. Um, <clears throat> so I, um, I actually did a project of map mapping what we could see of the Milky Way with one of the telescopes that later became an interferometer. Um, meanwhile, Bell Labs kept showing up, uh, asking about graduate students and telling us what a great thing Bell Labs was and how many interesting opportunities there were. And when I finished up, uh, they actually invited me here, and I visited Holmdel and uh, Murray Hill and Whippany. Uh, Crawford Hill was the main part of Holmdel I visited. And each place I could see things I would be interested in doing. But the thing that really attracted me was the, uh, the ability to use the 20-foot horn reflector on Crawford Hill. It had been built uh, a few years before for Project ECHO. Going back, when I was a first year graduate student, uh, the Russians uh, launched uh, Sputnik. And that really woke up the world, or woke up the US anyway. Uh, a fellow named John Pierce at Bell Labs had been thinking sort of along science fiction lines about communication satellites. So when he when there was a real satellite and NASA started planning to put up satellites, he really woke up and got Bell Labs interested. And they built the complex on top of Crawford Hill. Uh, NASA was going to put up a big balloon, 100 feet in diameter, metalized mylar balloon. Think of a huge party balloon. They were going to put it up in space, inflate it, and see what happened. Part of the idea was to see if there's enough material up there to slow it down or damage it. But <clears throat> Bell Labs decided to do a first communications experiment with it. So the idea was that there would be a transmitter and receiver on Crawford Hill and JPL would have a similar one. And once the balloon, and they built the 20 foot horn reflector for the receiver here. And can you describe the horn reflector for the folks? Some folks may be familiar with it, and it's still here in Homedale, a historical yes. artifact. <clears throat> it's a lo long horn with a piece of a paraboloid as a reflector. And metal, at the end correct? Of it. It's all metal. The thing is about 60 feet long. Its opening is 20 feet. That's why we call it, well, actually, its focal distance is 20 feet, which is why it's called 20 feet. But anyway, um, <clears throat> It's, you can, the dishes you're th you think of for communications and radar uh, are symmetric. This thing is very asymmetric. You start from the focus and have a horn going out and just like a cookie cutter, you took a little piece of the paraboloid. So signals come in, bounce off the paraboloid and are in focus down the horn. The, the big thing about that is that the receiver is very well shielded from the ground. If you take one of these paraboloids and put a receiver up here, it can see around the edge, picks up noise from the ground. Well, Bell Labs had a very low noise amplifier. They didn't want to mess it up with noise from the antenna, so they built a horn reflector. 
And what's noise? Like a lot of folks, lay people, we have an idea of what noise is, but it's noise just, has an altogether different meaning. Yeah, it's think. just, well, what I'm thinking of is thermal microwave radiation. Right, and I'm thinking of kids. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, this is pure hiss noise. If any of you ever experienced an old TV mm -hmm. before there was digital TV, you tuned to a non-channel, you got just a speckle pattern on the screen and hissing out of the, mm -hmm. out of the speaker. Uh, that all came from thermal noise, most of it from the, from the earth, but a little bit of it from the universe. And when you were young, like, like all the students in K through 12 right now, you uh, got your start really, your self start with, with working with radios and right. the vacuum, uh, the, the, the equipment yes. in the radios and then televisions, right? Is right. That... Yeah, when I was a kid, I got very interested in electronics and uh, read a lot, learned a lot, and I used to fix people's radios. And then in 1950, when television came to Houston, uh, a little bit later, I read about television, and I started fixing people's televisions also with vacuum tubes. Um, so all of this was familiar with me when I, to me when I got here. And I knew that the 20-foot horn reflector would be very good at rejecting noise from the earth. In my thesis at Caltech, I had tried to map the Milky Way, and I did it in a technique that radio astronomers normally use. You point, or sometimes you, you point, in this case, to the west of the Milky Way, let the Earth's rotation scan the beam across the Milky Way. So our chart recorder would have something which would come along up in the middle and back down. And I drew a, took a meter stick, drew a line across it, and measured up from there. But I knew that we're in the Milky Way. At the edges, there, we're still looking through some of it. And was that part of the way that how the science of radio astronomy started? Yes, because you couldn't control all of the things coming in your antenna. But if you look on the source and off the source, you, uh, you can measure it. No, the way science, the radio astronomy began was right here. In, right here? Right here. Well, Where you're sitting. Well, a thousand feet behind. that way, maybe. Wow. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the late 20s, AT&T uh, had Bell Labs set up, and they start, started being interested in radio telephone communication. And they started having field stations in New Jersey to get away from the noise in Manhattan. You know, you had streetcars and uh, all sorts of things making human-made noise. They ended up settling in Holmdale, right on this piece of land. And a fellow named Carl Jansky was newly hired, and he was asked to look into the sources of noise on uh, <clears throat> radio communications. And he built a special antenna which could rotate around looking at the horizon, and he set up to measure the amount of power it received, the thermal noise that it got, and was looking for what the other sources of noise were. And he saw thunderstorms. I guess when they drove a car nearby, he could see the ignition of the car and some, some radio transmissions. But he noticed a hiss that came up every day at about the same time and then went away. And the next day it was slightly different. And this went on for almost a year and it went all the way around the day. The th this is the 3%? No, oh, this, is no this, is, um, <clears throat> this is a small part of the noise on their, their transmission same. circuits. He had a friend who was a, an astronomer at Princeton and he talked to him about that and they got together and they figured out that the direction that noise was coming from was the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Wow, that's unbelievable. No one had any idea that you could, obviously there was optical astronomy, but no one knew you could measure these things by radio waves. And in 1933, I think, 
They, they went, they, he published a paper, on the, it was a front page on the New York Times about the discovery of radio waves from, from our galaxy. And so what's the practical impact of that? Because all of the things we have today are really building blocks on, on prior history, right? Yes. Well, that, <clears throat> that was the idea that there were radio waves coming from the, uni the rest of the universe. And it really wasn't, there was some effort during the Second World War, and some of the people with radars in the Second World War discovered the sun rising, making noise in their radar. The sun's oh, wow. very hot, so it makes a lot of thermal radiation. But only after the Second World War was the, um, the technology and the interest enough that people started exploring the radio universe. And using that for communications? Well, meanwhile, uh, Bell Labs had developed microwave relays for communications, and that was becoming very common after the Second World War. Uh, and radio waves were used for communications. But, <clears throat> let's see, we were about to talk about satellite uh, receivers, and so when the echo balloon went up. The mylar. My yeah, right. Big mylar balloon. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that happened, the first communication satellite, um, JPL broadcast Eisenhower's voice. It bounced off this balloon. It was picked up on Crawford Hill with a horn reflector and received. And it was sent out to the radio feeds as the first communication satellite. Wow. So that experiment, <clears throat> Bell Labs did things in a systematic way. It, it, meanwhile, they were trying to develop an active satellite which would be useful, which was called Telstar. But their idea was if they could get their feet wet with this balloon, they'd learn about ground stations and tracking <clears throat> and some of the practical problems. So when they got to their real satellite, they'd be in better shape. And um, meanwhile, uh, I was doing my experiments at Caltech and being courted by the Bell Labs uh, recruiter. Sly tackled or? Yeah. <laughs> he was very polite. <laughs> so uh, I was invited to come here and I saw the horn reflector and realized there were some things we could do with it that no other radio astronomer could do because it was a unique instrument. About a year before Arno Penzias had finished up his thesis at Columbia and been hired by Bell Labs. So I met him when I first came to interview and uh, decided, you know, I asked my wife which of a couple of jobs we should take. This was the bottom of the list. <laughs> but anyway, I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> That's great. So do you want to be a lawyer, an engineer, or be part of establishing the background to the Big Bang Theory? Well, I had no idea I was going to establish the background to the Big Bang Theory, but I knew that, that it could fill in things I couldn't do with other radio telescopes, like what, what was the background of the Milky Way that I had measured. Uh, so we came here, and Arno and I planned out uh, a group of, I don't know, five or six experiments that we, we were going to do. And we started transferring from a satellite receiver to a radio astronomy receiver. I built up a bunch of the electronics. Uh, Arno did, uh, worked on the Maser, and uh, anyway, we got it all together uh, about a year later. And when we first turned it on, we saw that the total noise being picked up was larger than we expected by about three degrees. And we thought, what's wrong here? Which yeah. part of this whole thing is not doing what it's supposed yeah. to do? That's right. Spoiler alert, he's about to make pigeons famous. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we started thinking of everything that could be wrong and how can, how can we rule these things out? I won't go through all of the, all of the things we thought of, but 
one idea was that here we are, most radio astronomers go to some desert or mountain or something where there are no people around. Here we are sitting on top of Crawford Hill, they've cleaned off the trees, and we have a direct view of New York City. All the noise that Bell Labs thought they were going to get away from. Maybe that's the problem. Well, we have the perfect detector. We turn the horn reflector around, aim it at New York City, nada. No change. No change. That, nothing special about New York City. The trees were just as bright as New York City. Um, I had been in Hawaii. Uh, my wife and I went to Hawaii right after our, my graduation. Uh, her sister was there, and we'd been on Oahu when the starfish nuclear explosion went off. We'd been seeing it in the papers, and when it went off, the sky, it was about 6 p.m., the sky lit up with a huge aurora, the whole thing. And uh, it calmed down after a bit. But this was a high altitude nuclear explosion. So Arno and I thought, maybe all those electrons it put into the Van Allen belts are making more radiation than we expect. But over the course of a year, it didn't reduce. And uh, those things we knew were decaying. Well, the thing that everything, everyone has heard about, there was a pair of pigeons that lived in the horn reflector. When we weren't using it, we would turn it down. They would fly up in. And when they got all the way to the end, they were just at the cab which was heated in the winter and cooled in the summer. Beautiful place to be. Every week something, something like every week, these two guys would come up, turn it around, do things for, I don't know, 15 hours or something. Pigeons would fly away. As soon as we were done, they would come back. And of course, you know how, what happens when there are pigeons on something. Mm -hmm. There's this white, as Arno described it, dielectric material <laughs> that they deposit inside our antenna. And we didn't think it was a good dielectric that it should have loss, it should radiate. Maybe it's the pigeon droppings. <laughs> yeah. So one day we got out a ladder, put on our white lab coats, got up in there with, and scrubbed the whole thing out. Again, very little, if any, difference. Pigeons were not the problem. Did they get a certifi certificate of recognition for disproving a uh, potential <laughs> obstacle? No, it was worse than that. <laughs> we, got a ha we didn't want them back. Uh, but you got them in the have a heart, right, first? Well, no. And yes, we got them in the have a heart. <laughs> we got a have a heart trap, put it where the receiver normally would be, and caught the two pigeons both in the same Avahart trap. I don't know how we were so lucky. Uh, there was a pigeon fancier at Whippany, so we put them in the company mail and mailed them to Whippany, <laughs> which was as far as the company mail would go. He took a look at them and said, these are junk pigeons, and let them go. Of course, next day, pigeons are back. Wow. So in the interest of science, our a technical support guy brought in his shotgun and dispatched them. Dispatched the pigeons. <laughs> so no more pigeon problem, even though they weren't really much of a problem. So after almost a year of scratching our heads, we had we had other things we were doing, so we weren't full time worrying about this. <clears throat> we were carrying on our other experiments like measuring the actual brightness of a, one of the standard radio sources in the sky, which we could do because we knew a lot about this antenna. Anyway, we were about out of, uh, of ideas of what might be causing this, when <clears throat> one day Arno called Bernie Burke, a, another radio astronomer, who, well, we'll get to him in a moment, <laughs> Anyway, neither Princeton? of them remembers what the, the fellow in Princeton. Uh, he was actually, I think, in Washington at the time, at Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. Arno and Bernie had been on a plane to uh, a meeting in Canada one time, and Ber Bernie was 
questioning Arno, why are you two guys at Bell Labs? Why aren't you at a proper research university? Uh, what are you going to do? And Arno had outlined our, what we were going to do, one of which was to measure, to see if there's a halo around our own galaxy. Is there some radiation coming from all directions around our galaxy? Bernie said, there's no halo, you're wasting your time. Well, we went ahead and did it anyway. So anyway, at this point, I think Arno called Bernie about something. Neither of them remembered later what the original question was. But at the end of the discussion, Bernie said, how's your crazy experiment going? And Arno laid it on him. We've got this extra noise. We can't understand it. We've done this, that, and the other to, uh, to try to figure out what could be causing it. Nothing seems to be causing it. Bernie said, call up Bob Dickey at Princeton. Okay. And the background to this is that Bob Dickey <clears throat> was a very good World War II uh, microwave man. He contributed to the MIT radar effort. Uh, in fact, he made low noise receivers um, and wrote one of the books in the Rad Lab series. But after the war, he got interested in gravity theory and oh, was invented what's known as the bronze Dickey extension to uh, general relativity. It was another term in general relativity. And he was very interested in trying to uh, show that this other term was needed and thinking about various experiments which could be done and in so doing, he thought about a Big Bang universe. Being a microwave guy, he, well, he realized that the, the original universe would have been very hot. And being a microwave guy, he realized it would be full of radiation. And he was enough of a physicist to realize that as the universe expanded, the radiation would cool. It's not the same, but the same as if you take a gas, in a, a high pressure gas, and uh, let it expand, it cooled. Well, the radiation does also. And so we realized there should be some microwave radiation left over. Mm -hmm. And he got two uh, postdocs. He was at Princeton, and he got two very good postdocs. Uh, one was Dave Wilkinson, who he asked to build a receiver to try to find the microwave radiation left over from the Big Bang. The other was Jim Peebles, who he asked to calculate what it might be. And it's easier to calculate than to build. And Jim finished up, and he was asked to give a talk at Johns Hopkins. And he said, can I talk about my calculations of radiation from the Big Bang to both Dave and Bob? And they said, sure. We're so far ahead, no one could catch up with us. Wow. So we went off to Johns Hopkins, gave a talk about radiation left over from the Big Bang, and uh, Bernie's friend was in the audience and told Bernie about it. And Bernie told Arno, and we called, uh, called up Bob Dickey, and Dave Wilkinson tells the story that they were having a bag lunch at Princeton, in, in Dickey's office, they would get together at least once a week to discuss progress. Phone rang, Dickey picks up the phone, and after a little bit they hear atmospheric radiation, sky noise, uh, antenna temperature, all the things they were interested in. Wow. At the end, Dickey put down the phone and said, boys, we've been scooped. That's amazing. I think Bell Labs had a sufficiently good re reputation that when Arno told them that you know, we'd measured this excess noise beyond what the antenna should be picking up, they believed it. So a week or so later, they came over, uh, and uh, we showed them our, our uh, instrument, uh, all the things we had done, and then we went in the conference room, and they described the theory. And um, we decided we would publish two papers. Uh, one, they would publish one about the theory. Our measurement might be wrong. We would publish one about 
the measurement. Their theory might be wrong, <laughs> but we will put them together in the Astrophysical Journal. Dr. Wilson, at that time, were you contemplating the broader impact of this uh, dovetailing of effort uh, and, the, and the import for the world? I don't think any of us realized what was going to happen in cosmology after this. <clears throat> you know, clearly, uh, let's see, my one cosmology course had been from, <clears throat> uh, oh, what's his name? Anyway, the, one of the creators of the steady state theory. And I sort of like the steady state theory. So initially we thought this, this Big Bang may be the right explanation. Maybe the steady state people, Fred Hoyle's people, could, um, uh, could explain it. So I wasn't even initially convinced that it had to be the Big Bang. Um, however, I fairly soon became convinced. Uh, then, uh, in actually a year after our first measurement, uh, we were up making measurements in the antenna, and a telephone call came in. This is the telephone company, and inside the cab of the horn reflector is a telephone, of course. So, uh, With a fantastic amplification system. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has a regular wire going out. <laughs> anyway, it was Walter Sullivan with the New York Times. Mm -hmm. He'd had a mole at the Astrophysical Journal who told him about all this, and he came up he called up to ask us some questions about things. Uh, and so, you know, we, we answered. And the next morning, my father was visiting from Houston. Uh, he had some business at Heightstown. And I was still sort of on a graduate student uh, schedule. Anyway, he got up earlier than we did and went down to the pharmacy in Homedale Village, bought a New York Times, and came back, and there on the front page of the New York Times was our 20-foot horn reflector. Oh, wow. And there were other pictures of the Princeton things back in it. Anyway, that's when it broke to the world. And so from a historical perspective, were, was this actively documented over time? You mentioned the New York Times. This ties into archiving and history, mm -hmm. uh, and it's all here, right here in Monmouth County. Uh, right. Were you... Uh, involved in the historic preservation as, as you're making history, uh, the folks that would work to document it and archive it and store it. Uh, Probably not all we should have. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, at one point, our, our boss said, find your first record and keep it. And we did. And it's now in a vault at the Library of Congress along with the Declaration of Independence. Other, That's incredible. Other documents. Because, uh, Clark Hanlon is a student of history and also working in the archives in the, the county, county operations. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're familiar with this incredible story. How has the county been involved uh, in that type of you know, early history um, and d documenting these types of things, intrinsic records and actual records and things? Because it's much more, folks, when you think of uh, a clerk, you think of more the, the uh, uh, day-to-day -day operations of, a, of, a, of an industry, a business, and what have you, the, the, the role of the clerk is, is, is quite specific in statute. Uh, yes, it's actually in the New Jersey Constitution, um, which is fascinating that it's actually laid out there. But um, the county clerk is constitutionally the keeper of the records. And most of that related to the land records um, in every county in the state of New Jersey to preserve ownership rights to land. Um, but in Monmouth County, uh, the county clerk became, in addition to that, the keeper of other historical records, mostly related to county government, but we have special collections. Um, and we also work to educate the public about um, the county's history. You know, most of our records do relate to county government dating back many years. Uh, but our special collections, you know, involve other aspects of history in the county. And interestingly enough, I brought one of our 
booklets that we prepared for our annual Archives Day uh, that relates to inventors and innovators in Monmouth County. And this was one of the ways that we were preserving some of the inventions that came out of Monmouth County and actually Bell Labs is uh, some of the inventions and discoveries are in this catalog because we do work to preserve um, some of our special history in Monmouth County. Um, one of the things you mentioned, first of all, that was absolutely fascinating and um, it is so important that you're here today telling the story because what we're doing now, because you're recording this, is documenting mm -hmm. the history of, of a lot of this. Um, but one of the things you mentioned is that you saved the first document and you said we didn't save enough or probably not enough of the records. And that's something so important that I really like people to think about um, because today we have had so much advancement in technology. Um, everything is born digitally and um, there are no papers to save. And I like to talk to people about thinking about what they need to save so that future generations can learn from our history. We're in like this digital black hole right now <laughs> where people are just thinking, oh, it's, my information is backed up somewhere. Um, but they don't think about 50 years from now how they're going to find that or is it still going to be there in the, um, in the format that it was today. And it just made me start thinking about that because you said we saved you know, the first record but we probably didn't save enough and thank goodness you're talking about it and um, explaining uh, the history and, and how everything transpired in terms of these amazing discoveries. Uh, but it's really important for people to think about, okay, today, <laughs> what am I gonna save that's critical? And how am I gonna find it? And that's one of the things that we do in our archives division. Uh, one of my missions right now in terms of the county government is making sure that everyone in, our, at least the county government, is thinking about the preservation side of our history rather than just the technological backup. But how are you saving it so that future generations can learn from what you did? And, and that's a really important thing. And also right to now. be able to capture the nuance of what's happening at yes, the moment. Yes. And uh, when, when, when folks are making history, um, they're so busy making history, they're not thinking, not thinking of how this is going it. to be historical, right? There are many people who went to the Gettysburg Address and left saying, that was a great speech. Correct. Right? Correct. I said, that guy Lincoln, yeah, he's something. Just a, a funny thing. You he's know, an up-and-comer. Yeah. With, with, my, with my children now, because yeah. everything they do, and so many parents here probably can relate to this, you know, my mother gave me things that I wrote when I was in college. She had mm -hmm. the paper. She handed it off to me. Now I have the paper. All of our children are doing things on their computers and... You know, it might be they may have submitted it to their school, but what are we saving, you know, for them? I like to talk to parents about that because I now force my children to give me a copy, a digital copy, a paper copy of something interesting that they did because otherwise I don't know where I'm going to find it. You know, there's so many things that you have to think about now. How am I going to save this for years to come? Because everything is created in a different way. And, and for the folks that are involved, you're, you're in, in the moment of creating the work. Maybe perhaps you can give advice to the folks who do document this work. For example, there's uh, a young student at home now. I'm just reading a, a brief article that he found a, um, another problem in Apple software for the second time. I heard it. What's the first this? time? I heard it's the second. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, Apple, you also have some issues over here. And uh, so um, that's an example of, well, maybe there's a little article. Maybe it's a, a Facebook post or something or certificate. Yes, but, don't assume the Facebook post will right. be there 50 years from now. Right, and, but, but perhaps is there a better way of documenting what exactly happened? Uh, because there's some fantastic video uh, uh, of you, doctor, and your peers mm. in the horn antenna and brushing those, you know, those, <laughs> the, uh, those wonderful, wonderful uh, you know, message carrier pigeons. Um, but, but that was really just probably offhanded video, not really thinking of... Oh, the, that the, was actually a re reproduction. We went back up later and had. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there was, See, that he documented, okay. right? Right. Okay. He does cameos. Made sure, yes. <laughs> yes. 
we made All right, sure well, so, it was documented. And that's a yeah. story. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a story because right. history, as you know it, it's actually somewhat a little bit different. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. What you say resonates. <clears throat> My wife recently decided to clean out the attic some. And <clears throat> when her mother died, she, or I guess before her mother died, she gave her uh, gave my wife <clears throat> all of the letters that she had written during the time when our children were young. Yes. And she's had a wonderful time looking through that collection of letters to r sort of relive our early adulthood. Yes, and I do worry about you know, from years if, to come. If you tried you know, to the, look the through your email, oh, forget it. It's so full <laughs> of crap. <Yeah>. But, <laughs> but, I, you know, but, but people don't realize that now <clears throat> as they're as they're doing the day to day. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to pick certain things that, regardless of what, it may be about something important, like the student that you were talking about, or it may be just something relating to things that your family is doing or, or something that you're working on, something special, or you know, pick and choose those things that you really want to save, but you also have to organize it in such a way that mm -hmm. you know where it is and you, and you're able, you're able it, to find it. And someone looking at it could see something important rather than just seeing a page full of junk. Correct. I've actually recently had this conversation with our county commissioners because um, it's really important to document what's going on right now uh, in terms of our day to day, you know, the special things, the important things. And one of them said to me, well, you know, I have it backed up on my computer. And I said, well, you know, 50 years from now, <laughs> is it going to be organized in such a way that a researcher or, uh, you know, a, a genealogist or anyone else that is looking for information is going to be able to find it? Because you have to index and you have to um, really create a searchable database where people can actually find things. Otherwise, it's just this, you know, mass of, of digital information. Well, you know, Christine, your office just produced an incredible piece of filmography regarding 9-11 that captured not just the, the facts of that, that devastating event, but the essence of the, 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 the human condition and the folks, uh, Sheriff Sean Golden and the other folks that were involved um, at, the, at that particular time, um, Bob Honaker and others. Um, where you're capturing it in a certain way. Can you speak to the, the, the methodology behind that? Really a work of art from a f film standpoint. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm really proud of that film and I'm encouraging everyone to watch it because it really uh, shows the impact of 9-11 on Monmouth County. Uh, and one of the things I learned from undertaking that project, you know, it's another thing that I, it relates to what I've been talking about in terms of preserving our history. You know, for many of us, that feels like yesterday, <laughs> you know, because we were all, you know, here for, for that uh, terrible event that happened in America. And it feels so close, but when you think about 20 years passing uh, and undertaking this project, I realize how much of our history relating to 9-11 has really disappeared. You know, people have passed away. I, I went down so many rabbit holes to try to find people that can mm. talk to what happened here in, in Monmouth County. Um, people forget. Um, and there, there was so little to work from mm -hmm. because items were not saved from 20 years ago. Um, and it was such a, a learning experience for me because I realized even within 20 years, there's so much information that, that you lose and uh, people are just, you know, moved away, uh, deceased. Um, and so it was a tremendous experience for me and so rewarding because I felt like I was really able to document this history for Monmouth County for generations to come to learn from. And I was actually able to find some original footage from that day at the ferry terminals. And I didn't even know it existed but I contacted maybe 10 people, you know, who led me to someone else to, to find that footage or to find that photograph that really um, showed 
uh, the heroism of you know some of our law enforcement officers who went to to Ground Zero to to help out uh, in the days after 9/11. So we approached that film um, first to document our history, but also to chronicle uh, really the human story and the human perspective and the heroism and and kind of end up with um, even though it was a terrible tragedy, you know, some of the um, positive human stories that came out of it, and to document those for, for our, you know, our children and grandchildren. So I'm really happy that we did it. And what, what would you say to folks who, uh, about, you were talking a little bit about being in the moment and documenting life's events and important things, um, and being really mindful of history, right? Uh, what would you share with the folks who are watching about being mindful of history in their moments, and it may be just everyday life moments that you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, what, what advice would you give them to kind of be mindful about it or to capture those moments um, as they're being created? Um, you know, it's really about being mindful and uh, decide, saving it in different ways. You know, don't, you, you really have to always update your technology. Uh, with respect to saving items, because you may have, you know, VCR tapes from, <laughs> from years ago. That you, How about eight millimeters? Yes, yeah, so the eight, <laughs> that you're not going to be able to utilize. So you really have to pay attention to um, saving things, uh, you know, in the current format, having backups, you know, whether you want to have like a little paper printout, uh, also for really special things. Um, you know, saving it digitally, but really keeping track in the years to come to converting the technology, you know, converting it to the latest technology and making sure it is something that lasts, you know, for, for many years. And really thinking about what are the special things that I want to, to have for my children. That, that yeah, Bell Labs film you saw <clears throat> was originally 16 millimeter. Oh, is that right? Uh, I had a copy in my basement which I gave to the Bell Labs archivist recently, but it got transferred to digital so you can see it. But as you say, it needs to be transferred to the latest digital yes. or it may not be visible. Yes, one of the projects we're working on right now in our archives, we actually sent it out to, to a company because it was such a major project, is we had these uh, News 34 tapes from many, many years ago uh, that chronicled news you know, in Monmouth County. And they were VCR tapes. So mm -hmm. we recently, you know, it's, it's over $100,000 <laughs> to do it, uh, but because there's so many of them. But we're in the process of uh, making those into, uh, you know, a more modern format that people can continue to do their research um, of Monmouth County's history. I just want to do two notes before I forget. Uh, one is that if you're interested in Monmouth County history, uh, this weekend, we have our annual Archives and History Day, uh, where we will be focusing on um, crisis uh, situations in Monmouth County over you know, the history of Monmouth County and the response. And we have um, many historical organizations that come and uh, set up tables. Uh, we have awards, we have a lecture by Melissa Ziobro, professor of history at Monmouth University, who's going to talk about 9-11 and the aftermath as, as our key you know, crisis that we were focusing on in Monmouth County. Uh, and it's at Brookdale Community College from uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., and it's open to everyone. It's free. Um, and also, I just want to say that we do take interns uh, in my that. office. That's great. Yeah. Um, we take fall and spring and then summer intern high school students, and we have them working on a variety of things. So just wanted to point that out. And what's the website if people want to connect with uh, your offices, whether it's the internship or the other different programming? Uh, yes, County. it's monmouthcountyclerk.com. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're interested in history, we have uh, uh, an archives full section of our website, it's just basically slash archives. And uh, we have a tremendous, millions of fascinating records that relate to Monmouth County history. Um, just one example, when we were, I, my children and uh, were studying abolition uh, in history class in grade school, and I brought them over to the computer and I said, I wanna show you an original record where a person in Monmouth County uh, freed one of their slaves. And there, lo and behold, the record pops up, and they were able to see this 
you know, tremendous piece of history. Uh, so there's so many records on our archive site that you can pull up and see uh, on, on our website. Thank you very much for that. You know, I wanted to go to a, a, a different topic or word that would be really wonderful for the students of today here, and it's uh, really about attainability. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, years ago, um, uh, you know, my, my former classmate, your son, Randall Wilson, mm -hmm. we graduated together. Uh, little did I know all, this, all these <laughs> tremendous exciting things as I was negotiating uh, with Fred Lucas about an in-school suspension, and it all worked <laughs> out, you know? So we all have different journeys in our life, right? And we're, we all have different things that, that we're good at and things that we're not so good at. Um, and what I mean by attainability is uh, I volunteer on the Homedale School Board, and we have approximately 3,000 fantastic students and their families, all learning and growing and doing with a broad curriculum. And the um, uh, st students through K through 12 have different abilities. They have different strengths and weaknesses and other types of things as they're going through their journey. And the reason I'm mentioning attainability, because you won the Nobel Prize in 1978. It was incredible, right? It's just it's amazing, amazing, amazing um, event and um, to the betterment of the planet, like quite literally the planet. Um, and so folks might say, you know, that's really, it's unattainable. It's so amazing, incredible, it's at a totally different level. But your story has its own journey, has its own navigation, where from, from the, you, as growing up and in school, um, you were, you had strengths in the maths and the sciences, um, but as I understand, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uniform. That's right, that's right. Can you speak to that? Because what I would like the students to hear is that you may be, you may be uh, fantastic in a certain area. You may not. You may struggle in other areas. And um, what should they be thinking about in their journey? And, and, and to follow their passions is what I'm driving at, um, because there's a broad, broad range of uh, intellectual curios curiosity, knowledge, and, and skills for for all children. Not to, obviously K through 12 in Homedale. What would you say to them that as they as they're thinking about their path? Well, I think it's very important to focus on things that <clears throat> you enjoy doing and are good at doing. Hopefully, there's some way of making money out of it but in the end. But um, I don't know that you can do that these days, but I was about a third from the top of my high school class. I had straight A's in science, math, uh, but not so good grades in some other subjects. Um, I had broad but, shoulders. I held up to two thirds. <laughs> <laughs> but um, fortunately, I got into a good school, and really, uh, you know, once I got in an environment where I was doing things I enjoyed, it really went very well. And uh, I think, what, how did it click? Like, did you because you got into you were uh, fixing radios and and getting involved in the the gears and, and that and it, yeah, I was I had learned a lot about electronics as a kid, and <clears throat> the other thing was that I had been, I grew up in Houston before the days of co air conditioning was common, and uh, I really wanted air conditioning, and I started reading about thermodynamics and uh, other things related to air conditioning and thinking about how you might put an air conditioner in a car, and <clears throat> I spent a, quite a bit of time in the Rice Library before, while I was a, gra a high school student, looking up these things I was interested in. <clears throat> and all of this came back later in my career as where I got ahead of other people who had not thought about some of these things. <clears throat> when I, I guess, as a senior I did a, uh, at Rice, I did a thesis of building a piece of electronics for a solid, for a low temperature physicist, <clears throat> which got me involved in low temperature physics. Then, when I was at Bell Labs, we had masers and coal loads. My low temperature physics came back. When I first showed up at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory of Caltech, my interest and knowledge of uh, uh, of electronics immediately came out because the other students uh, you know, might have been interested in astronomy, but I knew how the, the guts of the thing worked. From but your prior? In, from my prior, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> not necessarily academic experience. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, at least from my point of view, it's very important to to follow your your what you're really interested in because that's what you're going to <clears throat> learn about and do well in. Uh, not what your mother necessarily wants you to do. Yeah, and we, we talk about success so often, but can you speak to folks who are watching what the value is of failing when you, when you fail at something or something's not working out and how you, you detour and you learn a different way? Uh, what's, what's that process like? Well, <clears throat> let's see, this isn't, isn't exactly the answer to your question, <clears throat> but I've said many times that when, as a scientist, when your experiment goes wrong, that's when you should really pay attention. It's not just our experience. I've heard many other scientists say that, you know, something came up they weren't expecting, and that was the real breakthrough. So, uh, so if things don't go right, try to understand what went wrong. Maybe it merely means you'll do something different next time, but maybe it means something's going on that you didn't understand. Yeah. And that you ought to understand. And there are some incredible accidents out there, correct? Like post-it notes, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Things that are quite, quite by accident. There are right. different examples of scientists thinking, looking one direction and finding out something altogether different. Right. That's so. how all, the, the textbook idea of science is that you th think about things, make a theory, and then go test it. But what you're saying is what actually happens a lot of the time. You... You get new technology, you can investigate something that hasn't been investigated before, and something comes out that you weren't expecting. Mm. And some of that's out right now. Let me, can I ask you, uh, I think we have a fantastic person to ask here, Dr. Wilson. Can you speak to your thoughts of, like, it's 2021, alternative reality, AI, um, the new tech, blessing, burden, what do you, what do you see? What, what's the next big thing? Because in a little while we're gonna open up to questions. But what's the next big thing? What do you think of today's technology? Blessing, burden, or both? Uh, <clears throat> well, let's see. I think, the, I'm not sure what AI, or, well, AI, I guess, is going to. Robotics, artificial. Robotics, yeah. yes. I actually bought a Tesla recently, mm -hmm. and I don't think they're quite ready for full self-driving, from my <laughs> experience. But anyway. The idea the Wilson waiting, hovercraft is coming, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm waiting for that. The idea that uh, one might be able to, as one ages, get in a car and say, take me to the grocery store, is really appealing. That uh, if the human becomes less competent at things, uh, AI may be able to take over. But at this point, I think it's, it's a fair distance from actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> when I think about one of the big things recently, you know, the development of the web, <clears throat> it's made all sorts of things good. You know, if we're having a discussion, we can ask Google for the answer <laughs> instead of just battering it around for a long time or getting out the encyclopedia. But it's also enabled a lot of misinformation. And I think, I, w I would say to the school people that students ought to be taught about misinformation, how to determine, you know, what, what's really reliable. Like valid, uh, a way to validate. A way to validate things. Uh, I think this new technology opens new possibilities, both good and bad and that we have to be prepared to deal with the bad as well as the good. And how might that skew history? You know what, I actually want to, I totally agree with you, and it's something that I've thought about a lot and I've tried to um, educate educators that it's really important to go back to original sources too because you do mm -hmm. get skewed opinions and you know, because I have the county archives, there are so many things that students can learn from, from the original records. And oftentimes, the students are not going back to original sources. Mm -hmm. They're reading what somebody else thought about an original source, and that can be problematic. Um, so I agree with that, <laughs> uh, you know, in that sense. Um, that's very important for students to learn, mm -hmm. for sure. 
Well, I tell you, this has been an uh, incredible conversation so far. I appreciate it so much. Um, before we open it up to questions, could, could you share any, any, any key messages you want to share with folks, uh, the folks in the audience are listening, or, uh, or where they can go to learn more information, or just a, a, advice from, from someone who's been there, uh, involved in some of the, the wonderful areas of cosm cosmology, right, and the sciences? Oh, uh, I really don't have any good ideas at this point. Um, <clears throat> well, other than inventing and, and backing up the universe, so, you know, these simple things, right? Right. <laughs> I will say that one of the, <clears throat> um, I think that uh, one of the things we've been th thinking about a good bit recently is, uh, is the situation of the planet, global warming. There, there's something that uh, I guess Fermi said many years ago, uh, a great Italian physicist. You know, there are all these stars, probably planets around them. Now we know there are planets around them. Why have we never heard from any of these things? Is it that higher civilizations destroy themselves? Do they only have a short life? Why is with, with billions of other civilizations around, perhaps, we've never met one? Um, and I think it's something we should think about, especially in terms of what we've been doing to our planet. And I think we ought to take really seriously the question of uh, global climate change and warming and what we can do to reduce the amount of carbon, carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere so that the planet will continue to be livable. As far as the United States, how does it coordinate with the other world entities as well? Is that's a, I know it's a broader question, right. but is there, are there everyday things that uh, are not typically on the radar, so to speak, um, for the, the everyday family? We, we're familiar with the basics, reduce, reuse, recycle, things of that nature. Right. Is there some piece that's missing that folks can do different? It's hard to say. I don't expect folks to do things a lot different. Uh, they could buy smaller cars and use less fuel or eventually buy electric cars. But <clears throat> we need a lot of, we, we need clean energy. We need some way to store clean energy. I think storing clean energy is the hardest part of the present uh, problem. And maybe there will be better batteries invented or something for storing energy. But, uh, you know, at some point the wind doesn't blow and the sun isn't shining. And we've got, people are not going to put up with having the power goes off, go off then. I, I don't expect people to give up their lifestyle. I think we need to invent <clears throat> a way to supply that lifestyle uh, to people. Now certainly we can do things like uh, conserving uh, as we can, and uh, building better structures that don't take so much energy to control the climate. Um, and that's something which town governments can do, is, is force that on people. But, um, but basically, I don't think we're going to give up the lifestyle until things get worse. And, uh, well, hopefully they'll, they'll think of the right things, but based on the, the foundations of radio astronomy and your work and the work of your peers and the, and, and the folks that are at it now, we can help handle these bigger, bigger things mm -hmm. for, for, for a better world and, uh, and, and also document it appropriately, right? The, mm -hmm. uh, the integration of your work and the folks uh, like Dr. Wilson and the work that they're doing, are there areas of opportunity to create a, a, a different system of um, archive management uh, where it's more actively pursuing it? Is that another field of endeavor perhaps for either it's archivists or historians for all the work and, and the different technology we have for storing the work? Um, I think that the technology is there right now. I think for me it's more an educational process where, you know, across all industries, we have to be thinking about that preservation aspect because nobody is, well, most people are not preserving and documenting. Right. The technology is there to do it. It's having people take the time to do it right. properly <clears throat> um, and, and the interest 
That's and, the most and important choose thing. Choose the right things to document. C exactly, <clears throat> picking and choosing. You know, it is time consuming, and it is you need people designated to be right. working on that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a whole other aspect of the uh, of the industry to do that. Bell Labs actually has a an archivist named Ed yeah. Eckert. That's wonderful. Who has <clears throat> a, a lot of original Bell Labs material. They have a huge warehouse full of this stuff. So it hasn't all disappeared that's in the good. way you might think. Yeah, that's amazing. And they should be continuing, you know, because all of these changes that are amazing changes mm -hmm. that are happening yeah. uh, need to be documented as well. It's really something that people don't think about in their in their day to day. Right. And, you know, companies and governments, they're really not thinking about this at all. Um, I think in the next 10 years or so, maybe they'll, they'll start thinking about it more. Um, but it's something that I think everyone should be focused on. Well, and the, 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 the joy of having both of you here, it, it ties directly to how the chamber operates. It's a business and nonprofit and government and wellness and how, how everything ties together. Each month we have a, a, a topic. And if you look in our archives, I guess, mm -hmm. at the moment, you'll see wholly different topics uh, uh, with panels of folks that are really passionate about what they do, and we try to deliver that you know, every month. Uh, the, um, I wanted to open it up to questions, um, and for, but before we do, I just want to, again, just thank you so much. It's so incredible to have someone who's making and creating history and not, maybe not even thinking about it at that moment as it's, as it's happening, and folks who are dedicated to ensuring that generations today and in the future have access to learn and understand and grow from the work that has been done from our forebears. And it's, it's, it's really inextricably linked, isn't it, for, for a holistic society that succeeds. So yes, let's open it up to questions, if we may. Hey, Dona, uh, Sean Keating. We talked a little bit about storing history and leaving it for the future. The question I have is my grandfather used to say, statistics don't lie, statisticians do. So we have all this raw data, but most people don't have access to it. What we have is people's interpretation. So how do we go about deciding who gets to interpret the information and how it's interpreted for other people to know? That's a good question. I think it kind of depends upon what you know aspect and what type of information um, you're talking about. Um, it's, it's very important to maintain the original and the, the, even the raw <laughs> data <laughs> that you're talking about, um, and not always the interpretation of it. Um, but sometimes you have to go and create something. Like, for instance, with respect to this 9-11 video that I produced, there was really not much um, that we had. We had a few things from 20 years ago. So it's really, I was relying on people's recollections um, but it is a very important point, what you're saying, and, and uh, who, do, who undertakes that responsibility? You know, because then is it, you know, are you skewing the original data in some way? Um, so I guess each entity needs to make that determination um, as to how they're, how they're preserving. Um, it's really important to preserve, like, the original data. Um, and not always the analysis of that. Well, as well as the circumstances under which the data was taken. I mean, you <clears throat> need a clear description of what the data means. Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. the data is useless. Yes. <laughs> exactly, thank you. Yes? Hi, uh, Dr. Wilson. I, I was just curious, you know, have, having been a scientist, presumably, living a, a, a pretty quiet life for, for all those years leaving, leading up to 1978, how did the Nobel Prize, how did you receive it? How, how, did, the, how did you handle the notoriety that came after that? And, and, and for Bell Labs also, I'm sure it must have been uh, you know, a, a, a big event that, that changed things for a bit af afterwards. You know, actually, uh, <clears throat> Phil Anderson had won the Nobel Prize the year before, so they were all prepared. I wasn't quite so prepared. <clears throat> I tended to be a fairly quiet um, person and had to become more public. 
but the Nobel Prize opened up a lot of interesting opportunities. Uh, I chose to remain a scientist and uh, have been happy with that result. Uh, perhaps I haven't made as much of my prize as I might have, um, but uh, <clears throat> it, it did force me to become more public doing things like this. And, um, uh, you know, it's a different life, but uh, didn't preclude my doing the things I wanted to do. It, in fact, well, it opens up all sorts of opportunities. If you want to go in a, a different direction, you can, you can do so. The actual Nobel week uh, in Sweden was amazing. I mean, they treat you like royalty. Um, and it was just an absolutely amazing week. Thank you so much. Other questions? Uh, Russ, Russ McKeever. Um, and Christine knows me from Archive Day and a bunch of other things that I'm involved in. I hope in. I'll see you on Saturday. You certainly will. I'm covering three tables. <laughs> so, in any event, um, I just wanted to talk about archiving and preservation and more important memory. I will say, especially to the educators of the room, as the father of an educator, as the son of an educator, as a husband of an educator, the best thing to do is to get children and students talking to historians and archivists, reading in any way, shape, or form, and carrying the message forward. Because without that, all this eventually gets lost in memory. And I think we're actually, to talk about Monmouth County itself, I think we're at a very unique, in a very unique position, both technologically and in the history of the United States, even going back into prehistoric times, that a lot of stories that have been buried, we now have the ability to bring out and talk about and carry forward. So all I'm saying is just keep talking, go to Archive Day. If you've never been to Archive Day, Go, it's fascinating. Every historian, probably in Monmouth County, is there, right? So talk to them, learn from them, okay? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to briefly give the mic to the folks that are here from the district, of what you've heard so far, and how you think this may integrate, and what the, what the students may want to think about um, moving forward. Once again, I'm Elliot Cohen from Homedale High School, along with my supervisor, Karen McConnell. And thanks for having us here today. It's really tremendous. Uh, thanks for the offer for the internships as well. Um, just this connection here between the community and, and the chamber and the special events. And we've looked through the, uh, the Facebook page over the last couple of uh, days to really see how we can connect our school community to the members uh, that we have here. Dr. Wilson, um, our county clerk, is really going to be an asset to, um, to our school. Um, I'm just thinking about all the opportunities here, uh, just in this room with businesses and community members uh, that we can now have our students interact with, learn from the past, learn then skills for the future, and hopefully have uh, you know such a career that Dr. Wilson had by taking his passion uh, about science and, and electronics and be able to then do what they want to do. And that's our goal of a program that we're starting now, get those students now in high school trying to pursue those careers, learning from people that have done it and are passionate about it, have created maybe their own businesses, so then they can then move on and they can then uh, take those, that motivation that they have and pursue those careers as well. So thanks again for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I just want to piggyback, too, off of what you said about the historical um, implication for our students. So I started teaching, I graduated from Homedale High School. Um, I started teaching back in the 90s in Homedale, so my whole career has been here. And I taught astronomy to fifth graders for many, many years. And it wasn't until a teacher across the hallway told me about you, Dr. Wilson, that you were right here in Homedale. And at the time, it was in the 90s, and it wasn't, you know, we didn't have, um, email yet in the schools and I had no idea how to get in touch with you but it stuck with me mm -hmm. and then fast forward 20 years um, I became a supervisor and, and we were going as a district for future ready status 
And one thing that kept coming to my mind was that interaction I had with that teacher 20 years earlier and how we have to tap into our community. As a teacher, I always did. I always had parents come in, talk about their careers, but also talk about their life in Homedale. So you really, without knowing it, <laughs> um, was really, you were really a jump start for getting our career-based learning um, off the ground. So I want to thank you for that as well. And I wish back in the 90s that you were available to come into my classroom because <laughs> it would have been amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Yes. He'll be in your classroom next week. How's your availability? <laughs> 1990s, 2021, what's the difference? <laughs> yes, sir, uh, Dr. Wilson, I just wanted to ask, uh, earlier you were speaking about how uh, radio astronomy led to uh, you guys being able to do things that weren't possible with optical astronomy. In the, the last couple of years, they've been talking about using like gravity waves and things like that for uh, astronomy. I just didn't know if you had any like thoughts on that. Well, I think it's wonderful that we have <clears throat> We're still getting new ways of viewing the universe, and gravity waves are certainly the, the latest thing that's opened up. But uh, if you think about going back to the, let's say, prior to World War II, uh, I think all we had was optical telescopes. And now we have, um, <clears throat> we have radio, well, microwave, uh, infrared, optical, uh, gamma rays, uh, and now gravity waves. Uh, we can see a lot of different phenomena that we couldn't investigate well before. And it, it really works out well when something generates more than one kind of, of radiation that we can measure. It's Cosmology has grown tremendously during my career. There was very little that it did to explain uh, when I was a graduate student. And now there's a <clears throat> wonderful theory that hangs together very well. And we understand a lot of things that we didn't before. But I'm sure there's lots more to discover. Uh, as a simple explanation for that, is that uh, something like, uh, well, either 94% or 99% of the universe is something that we don't understand. And when we do understand it, our present ideas may be changed. So I hope we find out what dark energy and uh, dark matter are sometime in the future. Thank you, sir. Th thank you so very much. And you know, the uh, we're learning today, aren't mm -hmm. we? And yes. we're teaching today. Um, the uh, New Jersey um, uh, Chinese school had a, the 15th uh, annual memorial uh, celebration for Confucius this past week. Oh, and um, okay. Confucius from uh, I, 2,575th birthday. I may be off a few hundred years, but I think I might be right. But over 2,000 years ago, and he considered the, an, an original teacher. And the, I'm bringing it up because the, 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 during the event, it was really emphasized the critical importance of teachers and teaching and educating. And it was a, an event that was honoring teachers. And we have teachers here in this room. You never know where the ripples in the pond may go. And that's why the chamber meetings are so fantastic. You, there are relationships that come from these meetings. Uh, we're not familiar with all of them, but they're very, very many and varied. And so we want to, and on, on behalf of the chamber, want to thank the teachers, the teachers that are here, the teachers that are in the audience, all Homedale teachers and the teachers everywhere. Because without learning, you don't, you don't grow. Um, we're, we're honored that you're here. We're honored we have two teachers here. Um, both in your respective roles, and we hope to see you again, 
and we hope that this was of value to you as well, the interchange of information, and to hear from the, the next generation as well. I, I learned about gravity today. It's, <laughs> it's, it's more than just, you know, uh, more than just what, what, what we may assume. So I want to thank everyone who's watching this live, everyone who watches this program uh, on a recording, all the guests that, have, that are here. Thank you so much. We're honored that you shared your time with us today. And um, we just want to give you a, a round of applause, and thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me today. It was fascinating. So welcome. What pleasure to Thank you to very meet much. You. And thank you to a Shared Universe right. podcast. Yes. Have a wonderful day, everybody.